thank you so much for coming to the Lunch and Learn. We're so happy to have Eddie Martucci, comma pharmacist from Big Y here, to do another uh, presentation on viruses and vaccines and all that stuff. Um, before I turn the microphone over to Eddie, I just want everyone to um, thank him for bringing such a lovely lunch today. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Eddie. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, ladies, for doing all the serving, and uh, you guys are awesome. I love the turnout. This is great. Uh, as Deb said, uh, I am the managing pharmacist at Big Y Walpole. Uh, a little bit about me. You guys probably know too much about me already, though, because I'm always here. Uh, that uh, I had my own pharmacy in Connecticut for a dozen years, and we've done lots of different things, but Big Y is very big into giving back to the community, hence these lunch and learns. Uh, and as... Carrie and Deb told me, if you did get your flu vaccine from me, you can bring your receipt that you got to the senior center and they have a $25 gift card that you can collect from that. But I think you can only get one because I tried it more than once and they kicked me out. <laughs> so you're only allowed to get one. So today what I wanted to do is uh, talk to you guys about the flu vaccine, which is the best time now to get it. Flu vaccine, what now? And I feel like a pin cushion because we've had so many vaccines since 2020, haven't we? Yep. Yeah. And we just show you what a vaccine should look like. This is how you should get your vaccine. You can see that's proper technique, three inches from the shoulder and it goes straight into the arm. A vaccine uh, defined is a substance that's used to stimulate the production of antibodies and provide immunity against one or more diseases. So that's why we get vaccines. It's usually prepared from the foreign agent. They make it so that it cannot spread, it cannot replicate, uh, so it's inactivated. And then our bodies will produce antibodies to a certain part of that virus. And as you see here, I've done a schematic of the COVID, or SARS-CoV-2 virus, and most of the vaccines that we have are against those little spikes on the end to identify it as foreign. The goal is, uh, to get herd immunity, and I'm sure we've all used all that, and it doesn't mean that we want buffalo roaming around in our backyard. Although maybe it would be nice, I guess. Herd immunity is a form of indirect protection, and it's from an infectious agent, when a sufficient amount of our people have either become immune to it by either a vaccine, or having fought off the virus, or natural immunity, so that those people who lack immunity do not get, um, do not get the virus or the disease. It's a resistance to the spread of the disease within a community because we have a high number of people who no longer can get that disease in a serious way. What would be our goal of vaccines? And I have the COVID vaccine bottles up there. Well, the goal is to prevent an outbreak, which will happen. Viruses are nasty little buggers. They'll make themselves known to us by saying, hey, you're sick now, you have the sniffles, cough, cold, whatever, uh, from going from an outbreak to an epidemic, which is a, a higher amount of po people in a singular population, to a pandemic, which is everywhere, which is what happened with SARS-CoV-2 in 2020. Um, and that was our third uh, severe respiratory virus that had a breakout in 2002 and 2003. We had it in China. It came from civic cats. We had MERS, which is the Middle Eastern respiratory virus, and that one, respiratory syndrome, and that one ha came from camels, and then the one that in 2020 came from bats. And so those are called zoonotic viruses because they come from an animal world to us. The CDC has a great chart that you can look at and be confused at. Take Tylenol before you go on their website to look at it because it's very confusing. <laughs> But if you really want to, you can go to the cdc.gov uh, backslash vaccines, and you can type in an age, and it will tell you what vaccines you're supposed to have. Now, there's also a site that we report all of the vaccinations we give, and everybody who gives vaccines does. It's called MIIS, which stands for Massachusetts Immunization Information System, and that will list all the different, the different viruses that you have received. But it will also put up ones that they don't have listed that you may need if it's your, in your age group. So it's linked with the CDC to do that. The viruses, the vaccines I want to talk about today are the vaccines that we need for our population, those of us on the planet more than 65 years. 
So those are the ones that we need. You want to make sure you get the Shingrix against shingles and the Tdap, which is Boostrix. The two in yellow are our two friends that are the new COVID viruses, which are against the new strain that we'll talk about in a minute. The flu vaccine and the pneumonia vaccine. This is a chart that just tells us what vaccines, how often we should get them, whether they're covered by Medicare B, uh, whether they're alive, or whether we do a subcutaneous injection, which is under the skin, like you would do for insulin, or whether you're going straight into the muscle, into muscularly. You can see that most of them are covered by Medicare B. The ones that are not are now covered by Medicare D. Medicare D always quote unquote covered them, but they were brand name products. So they applied them to your deductible, but as of 1-1-2023, they were then covered with a zero copay, and I have a nice yay slide about that. Uh, you can see the pneumonia vaccines are ones we should get when we're over 65. The protocol from the CDC is to get the new immune 23, or uh, first, and then a year later you can get pregnant. Yes, Philip, a question already. Uh, I wanted to, oh, thank you. Uh, I wanted to ask you, what is the TDAP one? TDAP is tetanus, diphtheria, and pertussis. That's an every 10-year vaccine. Uh, those of us in our generation should be concerned if we're having a new baby join the family. We have a rat, mostly for pertussis, which is whooping cough. Most of us uh, in the United States, we eradicated it back in the 80s, early 80s. We've eradicated whooping cough. But many people come to our country, and their countries don't have the vaccine protocols that we have. Could I so just that's say, that I thought, you know, that the reason why I asked the question is um, I thought the pneumonia vaccine would be on your list. It is. Hello. Where is it? Right there. I don't see it. That's because you're blind. <laughs> no more cockle, no immune 23 and Pregna. Those are your pneumonias. And wait, wait, watch it, Philip. Watch it. It'll be on the bottom left. There you go. Pregna is in blue. No immune's in 23. And I was just explaining that when before you even asked. You get the no immune first, and that's an every 10 year vaccine. And then the Prevnar 20 is a once. It used to be Prevnar 13, then it went to 15, and now it's 20. Which means it has 20 different strains of the virus. Um, that being said, we're going to bird walk for a minute. My wife, Linda, who maybe one day you'll meet, uh, who I always talk about hates when I bird walk, but we're going to bird walk anyway. Um, the reason that they put multiple strains is our bodies, the way our immune system works, we build better antibodies when we have multiple strains of a virus that we're fighting. So we built better antibodies when we had the bivalent COVID vaccine than we, when we had the first COVID vaccine, or even this new one. MMR is a live virus. You probably don't need it unless you were born after 1957. Uh, you may need it, then your doctor would tell you. Uh, the only difference between live and attenuated viruses is that a live virus has to be given by itself within four weeks of any other vaccination. Whereas you can get some of the other ones concurrently at the same time. So here's our yay slide as of 1-1-23, as I said. Medicare Part D now pays with a zero copay for the Tdap vaccine and for the pneumonia vaccine. Well, pneumonia is Part B, the Tdap and the shingles, which the shingles shot is $211 each shot, and you have to get two of them. Tdap is a little less pricey. It's about $60. So I want to talk real quick about the newest vaccine that's out there. It's the RSV vaccine, which stands for Respiratory Syncopal Virus. Uh, and as we spoke earlier this morning, the, this virus is, is very hard on the very, very young and the very, very old. Uh, if you normally are healthy and moving around, even if you're over 60, you may get it, um, especially if you're dealing with little children, grandchildren, or a school or anything, because we know that there are little Petri dishes that carry everything to it, and they love to share. If you have everybody whatever cold they have. So normally you would just get a little bit of a headache, you might get a runny nose, you might get a little bit of a cough, but if you have some other issues, uh, some other concurrent diseases, then you may be at risk for it. And I'll tell you what the protocol is from the CDC in a second. The reason I have this screen up here is this is how we spread viruses. We spread them with a cough and with a sneeze. And I put this slide up to demonstrate the difference. It's the speed of, with which our air is expelled from our body. So a sneeze can travel at about 100 miles an hour. 
whereas a cough is about 30 or 40 miles an hour. So those droplets will spread to a larger area when we sneeze. And that brings us to what is our new normal. So our new normal probably is wearing masks if we're going out and people that we haven't met before or going into large groups. We should keep our physical distance, the one on the top right in yellow. They used to call that social distance, but we're social animals, and I, I don't really like that term, so I'm going to say physical distance of six feet. We get our vaccines, and we clean our hands a lot because that's normally how things are spread. The two viruses that, the two vaccines that are made to the RSV virus are by Pfizer, which is a Brisevo, and by uh, GlaxoSmithKline, which is a RexV, and that's the one that we have at the big Y. We have the Arexi virus uh, vaccine. Um, they're a little bit different. The Abrisvo by Pfizer is a bivalent, which is two strains. They're recommended if you're immunocompromised or over 60 years old with certain disease states. Just like any other vaccination, the adverse events that you can get from having a vaccine, you might get a headache, you might get a little fatigue, pain at the injection site, and muscle aches. Um, the difference with the Abrexi is that there's also some joint pain there, so you may just be aware of that when you have it. If you have like arthritis or maybe some joint issues and you're going to get the RSV vaccine, you may want to take some uh, ibuprofen if you're able to, if you're not taking any blood thinners uh, or uh, Tylenol for the pain of the joints that will happen when you get the shot. It's recommended for all immunocompromised individuals. And it's also recommended for people over 60 who have either the following breathing issues, which are COPD, asthma, or emphysema, or if you have cardiac issues, so congestive heart failure, or you've had a cardiac event. And a cardiac event is a heart attack, bypass surgery, you had stints put in, or you had a stroke. And the CDC said, as we spoke earlier, the way that they worded it, normally when a vaccine comes out, the CDC says, those people over this age get this vaccine. Well, with RSV, they said, those people over this age with these disease states and have been recommended to get the shot by their doctor should rush out and get the shot. So, we are a litigious society. So at Big Y, what we have done is we said, if you sign that you talk to your doctor, you can get the shot. So if you really want the shot, you can come in. All you have to do is say you're part of that group and you talk to your doctor and you're good to go. Nobody is going to hunt you down. Now, when you look at the wording, if you're used to work in legal things like my lovely wife did, it says under pain and penalty of perjury, you're saying you're part of that group, but it doesn't matter. Uh, nobody's going to come and hunt you down. I, don't, I think the Commonwealth of Massachusetts has more important things to do than worry about whether people are getting vaccinated. They probably want you to get vaccinated. I know that when we had Mr. Baker as governor, he'd probably write you a thank you note. So the flu vaccine, that's the one we have. Why should we get the flu vaccine? Well, this is some of the data from last year. You can see that there were between 27 million and 54 million illnesses. Between 300 and 650,000 hospitalizations just from the flu vaccine. Between 20 and 58,000 deaths in the United States just from the flu, just from getting the flu. But the real big thing is, are the next two points that I have up on that slide. If you're over the age of 65, you are two to three times more likely to have a stroke in the first two weeks of having the flu than others. If you're over 65, you're three to five times more likely to have a heart attack while you have the flu. So it's really important for those of us over the age of 65 to get the flu vaccine. Now you should be getting the high dose flu vaccine. Um, I turned 65 on September 16th and I had Samantha vaccinate me on that day with my high dose flu vaccine. It's important to get it. I'll tell you why when we get to that slide. The, the way that we build the vaccines against the flu are against two different things, N and H. N is neuraminase and H is a hemagglutinin. And what hemagglutinin does is hemagglutinin makes our red blood cells and white blood cells bind together so that they can't do their job and identify the virus as non-us. So that way we won't try to fight it off. And what the neuraminase does, the neuraminase breaks down our cell walls. So again, those white blood cells, the, the T identifiers, the T, the, the T killer cells and the B identifier cells that say that that's not us, can't function because their cell walls are compromised. 
So why does, how does the CDC choose each of our flu vaccines every year? There's always four strains. They're called quadrivalent. That's why we get the name quadrivalent. And there are four different criteria that the CDC uses to choose what strains they're using. Which agents cause the most sickness at the end of the last flu season and at the beginning of this flu season, current and past? What was the extent of the spread or the virulence? How quickly could I, if I had the flu, give it to all of you at this table? And how many of you would get that at this table? If I gave it to you and then three days later only one of you got sick, okay, it's not very virulent. But if I talk to you and I had it, and four of you got sick in a day, then it's a very virulent flu vaccine, a flu virus. So they would want to put that in the vaccination. And do we have any cross protection? Is it in the same family? And we'll talk about families when we get to the COVID vaccines too, but as a side point to that, back in 2011, there was a Texas flu that was very, very bad. It, it, it killed a lot of people. Uh, probably 40,000 people in Texas died because of that flu. So they put that vaccine in, they put that virus, a vaccine to that virus in the next year's flu vaccine. It changed a little bit over the year, and we'll talk about that in a minute. It changed, so it became a Louisiana one, but not as many people were even hospitalized because it was of the same family. So our bodies will realize that it could fight a part of that virus so that people wouldn't get very sick. It's based on year-round data that's collected at 144 influenza centers in 114 countries. They send all that data to the World Health Organization, and it's uh, analyzed and put into computers by people way smarter than I am to look and see what they're going to do. And these are the seven centers that are used throughout the world that were the World Health Organization. In the top right, you see Asterisk, Memphis, Tennessee, and Coltsville, Russia. Those deal with only animal flus. So they look at like the swine flu, which is H1N1. They look at the swine flu, or they look at other flus that come from different animals. And as we've talked earlier in the talk, as I mentioned, if it's a zoonotic virus, if it comes from an animal and it does spread into humans. In 2022-2023 season, the egg-based flu the vaccine had those four strains. Um, the cell-based, which is if you're allergic to eggs, they do make a vaccine that's used with canine kidney cells, which are dogs, dog kidney cells. And the only difference was they took out the A uh, virus, the, the H1N1, and they used one from Victoria, uh, Australia instead. And for this season, they're the same. Everything was the same. So they felt, the CDC felt that this would be the best vaccine that we could have to make sure we didn't spread what happened last year. Now cell base is a little bit different, the egg-free one. You can see that only the Darwin from Australia, A Darwin, is the same. The other ones are of the same families as the ones that we have in our, in our um, egg-based vaccination, but they're from different places. Fouquet is normally in everywhere. I, I don't know, it must be a very virulent virus. Uh, because they, that one has been in our vaccine for probably 10 years now. These are just some of the names that we have uh, that we use. We at Big Y use Fluorix, and we also have the Flu Cell Vax, which is the one that's egg free, and then we have Flu Zone High Dose for over 65. Now they used to make, we used to carry the Flu at Quad, which is not a high dose, but it's built specifically for those of us over 65 because we found that we got better uh, antibody response with it, but it, it didn't really um, sell. And unfortunately, we are a commercial company, so we have to sell the stuff we have. So we didn't carry that this year. The high-dose flu vaccine has four times the antigen in it, which means that we have built about 24% more, 24 more antibodies. So that's why those of us over 65 should get that. It's just like anything. Our car runs great when it's one year old. When it's 10 years old, it, does, it runs okay, but it doesn't do what it did when it was brand new. Same thing with our bodies. Our bodies don't process things like they did when we were 30. Our GI tract doesn't work the same way it did when we were 30. My eyes definitely don't work the same way they did when I was 30. Um, and I'm feeling my brain doesn't do the same thing all the time either. Um, 
So we can take Prevagen, because I've never met a jellyfish that forgot anything. Um, but, so that's why you should always get the high dose if you're of the age to do so. When should you get the flu vaccine? So this slide was put in this week. Now, if you haven't gotten it, you absolutely should go get the flu vaccine now. It normally takes us 14 days to build antibodies. So prior to COVID, the best time to get the flu vaccine was the second week of October through the first week of November, or second week of November. That covered you for coverage all the way through March. And that was important back then. When we go back and look at the last two decades, we find that only once did we have a flu outbreak, uh, an epidemic, not just an outbreak, an epidemic that was after February 1st, and unfortunately it happened in 2015, and it happened in the great commonwealth of Massachusetts. That was the year, if you remember, in February we got 102 inches of snow. So it was very cold, so a lot of people got that. So for three years after that, we had one of the B strains was the Massachusetts B strain of uh, flu virus that was in the vaccine. But the recommendation now, since they're all cold weather viruses, RSV is cold weather, the flu is cold weather, COVID is a cold weather virus, it's probably a good idea to get it the first week of October. We're already past that, so go get it now. Really important. As I said, it takes two weeks. Those people that have health concerns, and we can talk about that in a minute too. I, uh, in all of my years, uh, Connecticut pharmacists were able to vaccinate prior to Massachusetts pharmacists. So I've been vaccinating since about 2009. Um, and I can tell you some stories about some of the older individuals that were concerned about the flu vaccine uh, as to when they should get the shots. So our vaccination technique, we have that same slide up. It's an intramuscular injection, so it's 90 degrees. It goes straight into the arm. You want to be three inches or three fingers away from your shoulder into the deltoid muscle. What we do is we, a big while, we cleanse the area with alcohol. I kind of rub it a little hard, and then I wipe it off vigorously for two reasons. I'll tell you about that. We vaccinate, and then we used to clean it and put a Band-Aid on. We know you shoot through Band-Aids because there's lots of different types of Band-Aids, so it's, it stays clean for you. The reason I do rub it hard with alcohol and wipe it off that way is for two reasons. When alcohol evaporates, it cools the skin, so it desensitizes your skin. And then when I'm rubbing it and putting pressure on it, it also desensitizes your skin to the flu shot, so you don't feel it as much. Unless I use the really big needle. <laughs> So there are a couple of other band-aids that are out there. The one that's the Bionex makes a shot blocker and it has little plastic um, cones on it that desensitizes the whole area because there's pressure on those areas so you don't feel the shot at all. Your body just... It, it, the way our bodies work with nerves, if we have a pain impulse and it goes to our brain, if it continues to happen, if, there's, if the nerve is still getting that signal, the brain says, man, this guy is nuts. I'm not going to listen to him. That's why we've changed in athletics over the last 30, 40 years. We've changed from doing static stre stretching, like bending down and putting our palms to the floor and staying in that position, to dynamic stretching, where we stretch as we move, like doing lunges and things like that. So we stretch our muscles out in a way that we move. It's just better for us. What are some of the adverse events that can happen with a flu vaccine? Just like any other vaccination, you might get a sore arm, headache, some pain, maybe fever, arm swelling. Now, one of the arm swelling things is a pseudocellulitis. So the arm gets very red, it gets a little bit itchy, and it swells up. That happens in about one-third of 1% 1 of people who get the vaccination. Um, and we have had that encounter at our store. And you can put ice on it and take an antihistamine during the day, probably a Claritin or a Zyrtec so you don't fall asleep. At night, a Benadryl, that'll help you sleep at night too. And it'll go away within 36 hours. And these symptoms usually last one to two days. Anecdotally, you hear people say, I don't get the flu shot because whenever I get it, I always get sick. Well, you can't get sick from the vaccine itself, but after we've done about 12 and a half billion vaccines for COVID in the world, we've seen that the COVID vaccinations, specifically the new mRNA-made vaccines, which are Pfizer and Moderna, 
have reactivated viruses that live in our spinal cord. When we fight off, naturally fight off a virus in contact, we come in contact, our body fights it off and gets rid of it, it kind of stays dormant in our spinal cord. And it can come out due to stress or anxiety or trauma um, or maybe getting an mRNA vaccine. And we have seen that. Unfortunately for me, it happened with me with a young lady I vaccinated. Um, I vaccinated her with her first booster shot, so her third um, COVID shot a month before she got married. And two months later, she started to lose the peripheral vision in her right eye because it had reactivated a shingles virus that was in her spinal cord. And when this happened, we did lots of research. I talked to the people at Mass Eye and Ear who were our mavens when it comes to taking care of those organs in our body. And they sent me to a website where there are about a half a dozen other instances of that happening, where the shingles virus was reactivated and people were having some sight issues. And mostly it's just herpes zoster, which is shingles, or herpes simplex. So this was the original screen. I think I gave this talk to you guys a year and a half or two and a half years ago. Uh, and this is what the original vaccines looked like when they came out. And those two are gone because they really didn't live up to the hype. They didn't prove to be as um, effective as they said they were. As a matter of fact, the AstraZeneca model in Europe was stopped after its first dose. They wouldn't even let it get its second dose in because it was not effective. Novavax had their approval in July of 2022. Uh, they did their third stage clinical trials here in Boston. So that's a nice little company that did it. It's the same two-shot protocol, but it's not um, because it's against the regular SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus. It's not really that popular anymore. So the updated booster came out. We all were able to get two shots of the updated booster. Those of us over 65 are actually if you did all of your vaccine protocols, can have seven vaccinations for COVID. That's why you feel like a pincushion. Um, you could have gotten two of these boosters, which are bivalent. And as we mentioned earlier, when you have more than one strain of a virus in the vaccine, you get better antibody response. That was the protocol that they used, but that really doesn't matter anymore because that's all gone. So the new one that's out there is a monovalent against what is designated XBB.1.5, and they nicknamed it Kraken. And for those of us who like mythology, Kraken is a big old sea monster that I think Jules Verne beat up with his uh, sub submarine. Um, and they recommend it for everybody over the age of five. There are two different vaccines. There's one from five to 11 years old, and then there's those for 12 and above. We only carry a big Y, those for 12 and above. And you can get it as long as it's been two months since any other COVID vaccination. It's the newest one. Kraken is the fifth grandchild for Omicron. Omicron was the uh, first one that changed 30 different amino acids in the difference between the original virus of SARS-CoV-2. So this one was a, a very big change, so, and that was very virulent from Omicron. So Kraken is like the fifth grandchild. When we talk about generations changing, things change in generations. Um, for us, probably 15 generations or 20 generations ago, maybe we had a tail and we don't anymore. Um, but a generation for humans is 20 years. A generation for a virus is eight to 10 hours. So in a week, it can have 14 generation changes. So it can change to mutate, because they want to live too. Um, I don't think that they're part of the Bill of Rights, but they want to live, so they change to see how they can defeat our defense systems. Uh, it's almost like a war game that we play with viruses in our life. Uh, the X means it came from somewhere else. It was first in India, now it's in 38 countries. And the biggest part of it, and the reason that I recommend you get it, even though the antibody response isn't as great, is that 43% of the new infections in the last seven months in the US are caused by this virus, the Kraken virus. But even more astounding is 70% in New England are caused by that. So if you haven't gotten it, it may be a good idea to get it. The newest one that's coming out is called Parola, uh, BA.2.86. And again, it has another 30 amino acid changes and it's been a period, it was uh, picked up in four different countries, the United States being one of them. 
seems that us in the UK always are one of the first ones that wind up with having a, a new virus in there. We just want to be ahead of the curve, right? So we get everything new first. Uh, the World Health Organization has a couple of different designations for viruses. Variants of interest, and you can see Kraken is on that list, but Parola is not yet. And then variants of concern, those are the ones that are worried about becoming a pandemic, and that really hasn't happened yet for the World Health Organization. And if we step back one second with the World Health Organization, they're the ones originally in December of 2019 that said that this, that this outbreak of illness in China should be something we worry about. And a lot of countries said, ah, oh, no, it's okay, it's just the, the sickness that's in that one little area. But we are a global nation, we are a global world now, we're global people, we travel readily from one place to another. So, obviously we see what happened, COVID came around. This VAX record website is important because it will list every vaccine that you've gotten out, it goes back far for my technicians who are 27 and 30 years old, every vaccine they've ever gotten in Massachusetts is on them. For me, probably not. <laughs> I wanted to talk real quickly about combo vaccines. They were talking about combination vaccines with the flu vaccine and COVID. The problem is, is that COVID changes so much it doesn't do that. Now, Linda actually had a very big input on this slide because when I think of a combo meal, I grew up in the 70s, so I thought of a McDonald's. <laughs> and she said, McDonald's is no good food. Nobody should eat McDonald's. You have to make it nice. So soup and salad is good, I guess, during cold season for a combo. All four of the big companies, Moderna, Pfizer, uh, Novavax, and J&J uh, &J were working on it, but none of them have come to fruition yet. Maybe. I, I don't know. Everybody asks that question when they get their shots. Uh, am I going to have to do this every year? My answer is probably. When we talk about herd immunity, you need a percentage for that to be that virus to be eliminated. Most of the viruses that we get vaccines for every 10 years are in the herd immunity uh, number of 70 to 75 percent of the people. If they're immune, then the, those people that are not immune will not get it. For COVID, it's about 94 percent. And if we remember. Dr. Fauci originally said, oh, it's like 75%, and then two weeks later, ah, it's like 82%, and then four weeks after that, no, it's over 90% that we need to vaccinate. And logistically and realistically, are we really going to vaccinate 90% of the world? Probably not. They were originally going to come out with a trivalent vaccine before Kraken decided to rear its ugly head and infect so many people. Uh, the trivalent was going to have the SARS-CoV-2 original the Omicron, BA4 and 5, which was in the bivalent, and then it was going to use one of the ones, the Delta uh, variant, that was uh, very prominent in India. But that didn't happen either because it came up. One of the things I mentioned earlier about the when I first started vaccinating, I had a couple of people that would get two vaccines, two flu vaccines in a season. They'd get the first one in August when we first get our first shipments, and then they would get the second one in January. Um, in theory, our ivory tower thinking, you know, those of us that teach uh, yeah, in, in the colleges would say, sure, you're going to build better antibodies. Your system is already used to it. They already see how it's made. They can build better antibodies. Does it work in the real world? Well, again, as we spoke, as we get older, our bodies don't do what they used to do when we were 20 and 30. So maybe you're producing more antibodies. Maybe you're not. The biggest problem is cost. The insurance plans will only pay for one flu vaccine per season. Your seasons run from August of one year to March of the next. And the cost of a senior vaccine, our high dose, is $95. So a lot of people probably wouldn't do it just for cost. I know I wouldn't. And that's my whole talk. Do we have any questions? Yes, sir. That's a great question. The question is, in the COVID, does it matter which one you had and can you mix and match? And the answer is yes, you can. The CDC recommended when we were going for our fourth shots way back in 2021, the CDC said you could do that because there was some shortages of one or another in different parts of the country. Now, being the conscientious pharmacist that I am, I got both to see if I could say, yeah, you can do it, but I wouldn't do it because I felt terrible with one versus the other. Or yes, you can do it. I've had four Moderna shots, two Pfizer shots. They were all the same to me. 
I had no reactions except for number three, which was the first three were all Moderna. Number three, I was a little bit under the weather for a day. I watched a movie the next day. Good. Yes, ma'am. I've got two quick questions. Yes, ma'am. Which RSVs are you giving? Mm -hmm. First question was which RSV were, are we giving at the Big Y? We have a Rex V by uh, GlaxoSmithKline is the one that we have. We actually had both, but then there was a shortage of the Pfizer one. Pfizer had a shortage of both, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll do another one of those little bird walks. Pfizer had a shortage of both their, vac their COVID vaccination and their RSV because during the hurricane that happened uh, two months ago, they lost one of their supply plants. They lost one of their shipping plants. So they had some damage. And is there um, an issue with either one of them? I read too much. Um, that Higher level of antibodies. The, the question is the difference between the two. Let me come to you and see. Sorry, I'm making you swivel. We're going to have to pay her extra today. There were apparently more issues of Guillain Bears and people with atrial fib with one of these. Okay, so the question that she has is that there was uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome associated with one more than the other, and that one had cardiac issues. I have not seen data on that, but I can tell you that they are standard-made vaccines, which is the original way, which any standard-made vaccine does have an, an accelerated chance for having Guillain-Barre syndrome. Uh, especially if you've had that issue before in the past or have had other neurological issues like multiple sclerosis. So the, that, that's with one of them. Now when we talk about the cardiac issues, the data that I saw which originally came out, and I have to confess I haven't looked at it in two months since it came out. If you remember the mRNA vaccines had some cardiac issues too and it was mostly Moderna but it was in a very small group of population. It was 16 to 39 year old men. And it was if the vaccine was given, not in the muscle, but directly into a vein. I don't know if that's the case, um, but that's something you want to look at. You want to look at if you're, you read a lot and you have to be careful on the internet. I mean, the internet has a great, a lot of stuff, but you can probably find a study that will support any hypothesis that you have on the internet. So you just have to look at your sites. If I my recommendation would be to go to NIH, National Institutes of Health. Those guys are really good. CDC doesn't put anything out there before they look at it 18 times. So if you go to the CDC website and ask about that, and, or you go to the NIH and ask about it, then they can probably give you more information. And you're already talking about a future COVID? Probably. But I, I, I'm not the guy that builds the vaccines. But I would think that... Parola is, Parola is the newest variant, but we don't know how well it's going to go. They've, they've only seen it in four different countries, but it is, again, when they map it out for its RNA, ribonucleic acids, when they map it out, it has 30 different amino acid chains, changes. So that is, is big. That means it was one of the smart guys. It was like, um, I don't know, we'll go back to World War II. We are trying to fight Sherman tanks with uh, against their the big uh, T-77s that Russia uses. So, you know, their, their tanks are just bigger and better. So same situation. This virus has changed a lot of machinery to do that. I'm making you work again. Tomorrow's not going to like me. Philip, you had a question, I think. Yes, I, I appreciate the previous question about the R RSV. And I know that you, you're not a doctor, but you, you're great. But what, I've had two doctors at the Mass General said to me, get the RSV. But what is the reluctance where you have to sign a paper? There's, and, not, a, there's and, not a reluctance. The only reluctance is, is that we don't want lawyers to sue us. But, let's say that you don't fit into any of the group. <laughs> and you're let's just say... Let's just say you don't, and you got the vaccine, and I didn't have you sign it, and something bad happened, and I would never want anything bad to happen to you, Philip. But let's say something bad happened, like, I don't know, your feet fell off. So if your feet fell off, then you could sue me because you knew I was not in your group. But it, by you saying you talked to your doctor, and your doctor said it, you are now in the group. So you have nothing to worry about. All you have to do is check that off, sign it, 
and don't sign my name, sign your name, and then you can get the vaccination. Do they have full approval, or is that just emergency approval for the RSV from the CDC? The RSV is FDA-approved vaccination. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Yes, Franny? Anybody that gets the COVID now is the Kraken? Yes, that's all we can do. Uh, the question was... Um, the, anybody now, the vaccine that you get from COVID is just cracking, you can't get anything else. And yes, when the uh, bivalent vaccine came out, we had to send back all of the standard vaccine. When the new Kraken uh, vaccine came out, we had to send back all the bivalent vaccine. So yes, that's the way it is. Now you're not going to find it maybe readily available because now the government is not paying for it anymore. When it, originally, when the COVID vaccines came out, the government paid for it all, so we would just order it and they would send it to us, and if we wasted it, they just wanted to know demographically who was getting vaccinated. Now we have to pay for it. Uh, each vaccine costs about $103. So yes, all you can get that, because we, we've run into that. People who were reluctant to get vaccinated originally and reluctant to get their, their booster would wait until the end and say, okay, now I need it. So when this new bi vaccine came out, I had a whole bunch of people saying, well, I want the bivalent one so that I'm fully vaccinated because they're not worrying about that. Well, we don't have it anymore, so we can't help you. Are there any other questions? Yes? The new COVID that you said is not out yet. Oh, the new COVID variant, yeah. Are we going to have to get that along with Well, it, it, that's all up to, to see how bad it does. Right now, it's only in four countries. But if, if I go home and look on, on uh, the CDC's website and it says it's in 312 countries, then they're going to make one for you for next year. Or maybe in six months. Normally the protocol, and I, I'm only going by what has happened since 2020, and I'm not the brightest guy in the world. I know, Philip, you think I am, but I'm not. Um, I, I'm only going by what has happened in the past. The way it's happened in the past is that they've said, you get your first shot, you get your second shot in 21 to 42 days. You now can get a booster three months later. You now can get another booster five months later. When the new one came out, as long as you were two months past any COVID vaccination, you can get it. When this new one came out, almost, you know, any time, two months afterwards, I'm going to take this guy down and just put up a slide that, that tells you about the new normal real quick, so we should look at that, and then I'm going to change it to all the things that Big Y does. So anyway, that's the only thing. But I think maybe we will probably have a vaccine every year. Yes, sir? Uh, is it safe to get the flu in over China? That's a really good question as well. His question, he's had some really good questions. I think he gets a silver star. His question is, can you get the flu and the COVID vaccine together? Um, when I started vaccinating in 2009, we're going to bird walk because Linda loves it. Um, when I started vaccinating, they said you get one vaccine and you can't get another one for four weeks. That's what they said. So probably in 2011 or 2012, doctors were saying, I don't have time to keep having these people come back. I'm going to give a couple at once. So we started doing that too. So yes, you can. I have given three vaccinations in the same day. I wouldn't recommend it, and you certainly wouldn't do it in the same arm. Um, when you're talking about an intramuscular injection, you have severe, probably intolerable pain if you put two milliliters of volume into your muscle. So your flu vaccine, for those of us over 65, is three quarters of a milliliter. And the COVID vaccine, if you get Moderna, is a half a milliliter. If you get Pfizer, it's one third of a milliliter. So you're okay there. Um, but I wouldn't recommend doing three. And you can't do them in the same arm. I would say that probably 45% of the vaccines that I've done this season, I've given two vaccines at once. And of that, 80% of them have been in the same arm. And I haven't had anybody say to me anything more than my arm hurts. Now, that being said, this year, the high-dose flu vaccine, for those of us who got it, my arm did hurt, and the flu vaccine never bothered me at all. My arm did hurt later that night, but I was still, the next day, I was up at... 5.30 to go to the gym like I am most mornings. And I did all my workout and I didn't have a problem. Any other questions? Well, I want to thank you all for coming. I want to thank the people at the Walpole Council of Aging. They've done a great job. And thank you, Philip, for joining us from another time.